uh, you know, the whole world is dynamically different. Uh, you know, our church is dynamically different. Uh, you know, uh, these, these times are just a different, they're just different times. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the, uh, the, the greatest travesties that comes out from the pandemic, you know, is the condition of the church and what has happened mm -hmm. as far as like how, you know, services are. It's, it, everything's different, you know, you can watch at home. And it's, so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but you know, I, you don't even have to come. You know, it's just, you know, you, you, everybody's gotten used to it. And so on days like this, you know, it, it, it's kind of sober, but you know, we do thank God for the opportunity that we still have to be able to minister the gospel and preach the gospel. Amen. So uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're definitely doing that. <clears throat> we do want to welcome our, our Facebook Live audience and uh, those that don't view the broadcast on YouTube. We want to thank you guys for being a part of us as we uh, continue to go into the Word on today. Uh, so that's what we're going to continue to do. Well, you guys know today is Mother's Day. As you well know, we want to say Happy Mother's Day to all our mothers. We want to say Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers that may be listening. And uh, we want to we want to appreciate them and honor them today. And I thought it would be fitting uh, that, you know, we can pause our study of Revelation one more time. You know, because we have to do that seventh bowl. And it's not a pretty bowl, you know. Uh, you know so I, I thought it would be fitting that we kind of pause that. And then we'll pick back up with it on next Sunday uh, as well. So I think I think that's fine. I think uh, you know we're not we're not violating anything by doing that. And so this is a good opportunity for me to teach something today. And so uh, today I want to just speak to the mothers, and we're going to kind of talk a little bit about you know a certain a set of scriptures that we'll look at. But our whole goal is just to to kind of present it from a biblical view. And I do appreciate what. Kevin said, you know, that's what we try to do here. We try to uplift the Word of God. Nothing that I try to give you is my opinion here. I try to give you the Bible. And if if people are offended, typically, you know, we won't want to admit it. We're offended with what the Scriptures say. And that's how truth is. The nature and the dynamic of truth is that it can be offensive. Not that the person is being offensive. It's not that the person is being rude, but truth has that nature. I love what Paul says in Galatians chapter 4 to the Galatians. He says, have I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The same people that Paul brought into the faith, the Galatians, are now treating Paul as their enemy because Paul is telling them the truth. And what is he telling them the truth? Well, if you go back to chapter 1, he says, you know, uh, man, I'm marvel to know that you've left the grace that I, I just gave it to you. You done left it alone to go to these Judaizes in chapter 3 he really levels and says, you know, who has bewitched you? Oh, foolish. That word foolish there is silly. Oh, stupid Galatians. I mean, you know that <laughs> Paul was very, very straightforward in how he felt about them uh, 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 perverting the gospel by listening to these Judaizers. Which, well, with that, that's how we understand that truth can be offensive. And so that's what we try to do. We endeavor to teach the Bible. We endeavor to teach the Bible we, well, because that is what is the basis of truth, is the scripture. The basis of truth is not a sermon that is filled with good advice. The basis of truth is not the world. There is no truth in the world. And when you tell people that, you're not talking, you know, somebody said, well, you just said it's not any truth. Well, I'm not talking about them telling you how to do your taxes. That's true. Or the world telling you how to put together a lawnmower. You know, are, are the world telling you, hey, you know, it, it's 370 miles to Miami. That's a lie. That's a lie. No, that, that's the truth. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. That, 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 that's, not, that's, that's not truth in the sense of how it affects your eternity. Truth, how it affects your viewpoint and perspective. That's what the Bible does. The Bible deals with the penetrating truth that reaches down to the soul that transforms the soul. And that's the whole goal of what we're trying to do here. So we want to pause just for a minute. Just for a minute. We're going to pick back up with Revelation. And we'll just talk a little bit to the women about God's view of a Christian woman. And we'll look at some things today. And I think it's going to be enriching. I think it's going to be uplifted as we go through these verses. Now, the question today, however, would be this. How do you honor mothers in today's culture? How do you honor mothers in today's culture? And I laugh because most would casually say, give her a break from the kids. <laughs> you know, that would be pretty much it. You heard mom say, you know, uh, in one of the little readings, you know, give them a break from the, from, from, from the housework and different things of that nature now. And, 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 and 
the fact that that is probably true in today's culture, that is something that has been cultivated for decades. That type of thinking. That's true. That type of perspective. And you guys know how I am. I like to, I love history. You know, I don't like to just start talking. I like to give you a little bit of history. I want you to follow this. Um, in, in 1950, and, and really, you know, as I look around, uh, uh, we don't have anybody. We have people who were born before 1950, but through the 50s, you would have been younger. Like, I know my mom was grew up in the 50s, but where would you would have been mom? And, uh, uh, probably in, in single digits, maybe uh, yeah. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you see. So in 1950s, in the 1950s, here is what you would have seen depicted of women throughout society. I want you to just listen to this. 1950s, so that would be what? 70 years ago, correct? You would have had them depicting as ironing, mm -hmm. cleaning the house, mm -hmm. vacuuming, yes. doing various houseworks as they advertise certain household products for the family. So in other words, if you saw women on television and commercials, they were doing these things as they advertised the product. So there would be the woman there ironing the clothes and she's advertising an iron. Vacuuming the floor as she was advertising the vacuum. So there were women in commercials, but this is how they were depicted. They were also depicted as cooking dinner for the family, sitting on the couch reading to the kids, playing games with the kids in the backyard, or pushing a stroller down the street as she went for a walk around the block. This is what you would have saw in the 50s. This is what you would have saw. Think about it. That's what you would have saw women as depicted in the 50s. Today, these advertisements of what I just described and these depictions would offend almost all women today, especially here in America, including most Christian women would be offend offended by that. Think about it, 2021, if those were all the commercials you saw of women, oh my God, it, the, it would be labeled as misogynistic. It would be labeled as degrading to women. It would be uh, labeled as sexist. So a 70-year swing of having women depicted like that is now considered misogynistic today. It's as a matter of fact, if you see the commercials today, you'll have men advertising these products. You see? And so just think about it. This was in the 50s, and this was okay in the 50s. This is what you expected. Now watch this. However, in the 1960s, the modern feminist movement was born. At the end of World War II in 1947, many women found themselves without husbands as the war alone killed over 75 million people worldwide. I want you to think about that. Isn't that a staggering number? World War II is considered as the most, well, the most bloodiest war is the Civil War. That's the most bloodiest war. World War II is considered as the most devastating war because in that war over 75 million people died worldwide. And I kept researching to try to find the number uh, for the men and it's very hard. The number ranges anywhere between 30 to 40 million men perished. So during, in 1947, many, at, at the end of that war, many women found themselves without husbands. Watch this. Women had to enter the workforce during World War II to help build military weapons, ammunitions, uni uh, make uniforms, and to care for the wounded. That's how the nursing field really began to explode because women ran to those fields to help. You needed somebody to build the weapons in the factory. So guess what? Where were the men? They were out there in the war. So the women went to work. This trend would continue to, continue to spread behind the scenes in 19, in the, throughout the 1950s and go mainstream throughout the 1960s until a popular book was written in 1949. Now, this book was written back in 1949, but it didn't become popular until the 60s. 1968 to be exact. If you were going to look up when does the modern feminist movement begin, it began in 1968. 1968. Now, this book was two volumes and it was entitled The Second Sex, written by Simone uh, 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 de Beauvoir. She's a French. Now, listen to this. She was a French writer, a philosopher, a political activist, a feminist, and a social theorist. 
Mm. This is who this lady was. And see, this is why we, we mostly don't care about philosophy. You know, if your child come and tell you, I'm going to be a philosophy major, what? But why is philosophy important? Because that is what sets the culture. That is what sets the thinking. Mm -hmm. The reason why we are a pragmatic culture is because that is a philosophy. You get it? Do you understand it? Communism, socialism is a philosophy. Democracy is a, it, it's a government order, but it's a philosophy. Guess who comes up with these things? Philosophers. So you, may, you and I may not care about philosophy. I don't want to go into that. But they set how people think in society. And I want you to see, this is what this woman's book did. The book was, detail, was meant to detail the treatment of women throughout the history of civilization. There were three main things she argued in this book that came to define and set the women's movement. Number one, she argued that man is considered the default while women are considered as the other. So she spent time arguing this point that you as a woman are the other. Men are the default. You are the other. Now watch this. Here's what the Bible says in defense against that. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it says, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish to sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice what the Bible says. Does the Bible classify women as the other? No. no. Notice that when it says that when God made man, he made man in his own image, but he made sure he said male and female. To let the female know you are too made in the image of God. Even though you come from man, you are made in the image of God. You follow that? Well, this woman argues an ideology that you are the other. So that would permeate in society. We're, you're the other. You're looked down upon. You see? What was the second point she argued? She argued that women needed to define themselves no longer and no longer be defined relative to men. But I want you to think about this. The first point is you're the other. The second point is we as women need to define ourselves. No longer should we be defined in relation to men. We need to be our own person. We need to define ourselves. Now look at this now. Here's what God says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. And while he slept, he took one of the ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that, God, uh, that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made or fashioned into a woman and brought her to man. So, because that's how women were created, can women necessarily define themselves apart from man? Okay. Maybe 1 Corinthians will answer it. 1 Corinthians 11. Listen to 3. Listen to 1, 11, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Do you guys believe the Bible? So let's scriptura. 1 Corinthians 11.3 But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ and the head of a wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. Verse 8 For man was not made from woman but man from woman I'm, I'm sorry, but for woman from man. Verse 9 Neither was man created for woman but woman for man. Now Simone says, we need to define our own selves apart from men. The Bible says the whole purpose why God made woman was for man. 
Okay. Y'all, y'all still with me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, Simone says, define yourself. Be your own self. That's the feminist movement. Here's the third point she argued. <laughs> she argued this. It was difficult. She says this. It was difficult for talented women to become <laughs> successful because of societal imposed domestic responsibilities. So the first point she argued was, you're the other. You need to make yourself known. The second point she argued was, you need to define yourself away from the man. The third point she argued is, the reason why you can't be successful is because of these societal imposed domestic responsibilities that have been placed upon the woman. That's why you can't be successful. Break free of that. Here you are. Well, here's what God says in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior. Not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to treat, they are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children. Here's what else they ought to train. Verse 5. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands. But why we got to do that? That the word of God may not be reviled. Wow. Mm. Oh, okay. Simone says, we need to, you need to break free from these domestic responsibilities. God says, that's why you were. That's what you were supposed to. <laughs> you all want to go back to Revelation 16? <laughs> no, honestly. This is, this is the Bible. It's going to be good, guys. Just, just here. Give me the bowl. <laughs> Listen, give me the bowl. <laughs> overall, over, are y'all still with me, ladies? Y'all love the Bible. Come on, everybody. everybody ladies, men, take a deep breath. This is the Bible. Again, we, we know that this is how the culture is, but this is what the scripture says. Overall, what she injected into society was that to advance women in the world, they needed to be, listen to what she said at the close of her book. She says, here's what we need to do. The women need to be raised differently. And here's what she says. They need to be raised differently. No longer raised according to the duties of the mother, <coughs> but now according to the accomplishments of the father. So in other words, here's how we can change and make this women's movement be thing. Let's move her away from teaching her duties to now teach her accomplishments. And that set the women's movement on fire. This view and philosophy, this ideology, would come to form the foundation of the feminist movement in America, and it would catch fire in the 1970s, and it would become ablaze in the 1980s. Shows like, and the three shows that they mentioned were Murphy Brown, Mur- Murphy, yeah. Murphy Brown, Murphy Brown, designing women, designer women, uh, that show, mm-hmm. and it was another show that became to be. The main catalyst shows that would really come to set the feminist movement on fire. Watch this. <laughs> Listen to this. It doesn't stop there because women still had a problem. Man, I, I got to hurry because I, I got a lot I want to cover, but I, I want you to get this. <laughs> Kevin, they still got a problem. It's this pregnancy stuff. It's this marriage stuff. Now, watch this. How did they help that? Through the legalization of birth control by the Supreme Court in 1965. Women could now break free from the fear of becoming pregnant, Mm -hmm. thus hindering her success and equality in society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Through the legalization of abortion by the Supreme Court in 1973, women could now terminate an unwanted pregnancy all in the name of reproductive rights. 
One of the slogans, Nancy, of, for abortion in 1973 for legalizing it was this. Listen to this slogan. Reproduction freedom from reproduction slavery. Today, over 65 million babies have been murdered in the womb of a woman. That sets the movement. So what about 2021? Well, in 2021, women are depicted as career women, sailing down the highway on a cell phone, speeding as she's late for work. She is a fitness fanatic, wearing workout clothes as normal, everyday attire. She is a proud, loud, and outspoken lesbian, transgender, or she's a player, multiple divorcee. She believes that she is a sex symbol goddess, wearing clothing that has her half naked, leaving nothing to the imagination. And I like what this says, those are just the grandmothers. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me read to you all this. Let me read to you all what one theologian wrote about today's women, woman. And I found this in a book, and it was very interesting. Are y'all ready, women? Are y'all ready? Okay. I don't know. Listen to what he wrote, and it's pretty. I want to read it. I'm just going to read it. He says, the woman of this particular era, the modern woman, sort of looks like this. She works, she builds and submits to her career while she refuses to build and submit to her husband. She demands equality with him in everything. She has an affair or two or maybe a divorce or two. She exercises her dependence. <coughs> she relies on her own resources and she does not want her husband or her children to threaten her personal goals. She hires a maid or a cleaning service, eats out at least 50% of the time with her family or without them. She provides assorted boxes of cold cereal or microwavable food for breakfast for the kids and usually nothing for the husband. She expects and demands her husband to do his share of the housework because she pays her share of the bills or even all of them. She is into all the worldly fashions, trends, while making sure her dress, looks, and body grabs the attention of both men and women. The kids spend more time in daycare and public school than they do with her, and she makes sure that every one of them has a TV, a cell phone, and an iPad so that they can be entertained and not bother her, all while, she, uh, while they're being brainwashed by an immoral and moralistic society. She is busy cultivating her own interests, lusts, and dreams. She is usually opinionated, demands to be heard from, and is eager to fulfill all of her personal ambitions, and the world lifts her up as a supermodel and a superwoman and a supermom for the world to follow. She cannot stay happy because internally she is often depressed and does not like herself or her life, or she just lies to herself to boost up her own confidence. She is also not that fond of her husband and the children she could do with or without. She raises her daughter to be just like her and becomes the model for the kind of woman her son will marry. She is a far cry from the excellent woman described in Proverbs 31. Wait on Father's Day, you hear what he wrote about the men. <laughs> We're not even going to get up. <laughs> Wait till you hear me. We'll deal with that. We'll we get you men on Father's Day. <laughs> no, we need revelation. Go to Proverbs 31. <laughs> we should be at the bride. <laughs> I like what Bodie Barber said, if you can't say amen, say ouch. <laughs> yeah. When you say that, describes the modern woman to a T. Maybe not every quality. Yeah. Pretty much. But, but can, it, it, yeah. can any woman follow on the sword and say, yeah, I'm, a little, I'm in a little bit of that. Yeah. 
Look at Proverbs 31. There are a few things that we should know before we look into these verses. <clears throat> there are some things, three things that I want you to know. This is a good backdrop to Proverbs 31. The first thing is that Proverbs 31 is not about a specific woman in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Some commentaries would say it's Solomon's mother, Bathsheba. It ain't about her. Bathsheba's already disqualified. Others say it's about Hannah, while some say it's about Sarah. But when you go study it out, it's really not about a specific woman. Here's what I want you to get, and this is for the women as well, for women especially. The application of these verses for women is that this is the ideal Christian woman. This should be the goal of every Christian woman. This is the biblical standard for Christian women. So in other words, when you read this, women, you're not reading Proverbs 31 to say, who is this? It ain't no woman. <laughs> it's the ideal woman. It is the biblical view of a Christian woman. It is, God, it is God's view of the goal that every Christian woman should strive towards. The second thing to remember is that, the, that no one woman will exemplify every one of these godly traits. God does not want you to turn this into a law that you tick off as you believe certain passages are describing what you already believe about yourself. This also isn't some every quality that the man memorizes so he can throw up back to his wife when well, you ain't doing uh, verse 16. <laughs> you see, that's not why it's written like that. The application is that this should be the direction of your life as a Christian woman. The more you grow in Christ, the more your life in Christ should begin to exemplify those godly characters. So in other words, the more you grow in Christ, the more your life should begin to look like the Proverbs 31 woman. It becomes the mirror that the Christian, say Christian. I didn't say Nene Browns, Nene Lakes. See, I, 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 I didn't, I'm not talking about the stars. I'm not talking about Beyonce. This is the mirror for the Christian woman. The Christian woman. So women, if you are a believer, this is your goal. Okay. This, you need to memorize this. Because this is, this is where you desire to be. Are you going to do it perfectly? No. What do we always say? It is not about the perfection of your life. It's always about the direction of your life. Yeah. As a Christian woman, your life should not resemble more like the women of the world while you look absolutely nothing like the verses in Proverbs 31. If you find yourself looking more like the world's women, woman, and you have none of these qualities in Proverbs 31, are you just laughing? please, then you might want to go to 2 Corinthians 13, 5 and say, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Lest you be reprobate. Okay? As a Christian woman, your life should not resemble the world. That's what we're trying to get you to see. Because why? Before you get to Proverbs 31, a lot of women like to run to Proverbs 31. A lot of men like to run to Proverbs 31. But do you know we meet some more women in Proverbs before we get to Proverbs 31? How about in the first couple of chapters we meet the adulterous woman? The seductress. How about Proverbs also talks about the noisy woman? It talks about the foolish woman. It talks about the rebellious woman. It talks about the quarrelsome woman. So see, before you get to 31... You have all these other women that Proverbs talks about. And it talks about men as well. But here, this is what I want you to see. You have, have, have you met any of these other women? You know, you want to make sure that you're not the noisy woman. Loud. Loud and wrong. You're the <laughs> foolish woman. The word foolish there literally means moronic, stupid. The rebellious woman. You just a, you just a rebellion. You always going against everything. You're the quarrelsome woman, the nagging woman, this quarrelsome, always picking a fight, always got an ill temper. Or, God forbid, you're the adulteress. 
You are the temptress. You are the seductress. You are the one that goes out there and tempt a man and destroys everything. You have to meet those women first before you get to the excellent woman or the virtuous woman. Lastly, I want us to understand and accept, here's the big one, Kevin, that the world will never praise this type of woman. They will never exalt the Proverbs 31 woman. Listen to what Sheila Cronin, who was the once disgraced leader of the National Organization for Women. Now, that group. She's a disgraced leader. Why is she disgraced? Because listen to what she was quoted saying. She said, since marriage constitutes slavery for women, it is clear that the women's movement must concentrate on attacking this institution. Freedom for women cannot be won without the abolition of marriage. This woman says, in order for women to truly be free, we have to abolish marriage. You say, well, man, I'm glad they ain't doing that. <laughs> say ideology. ideology. This is what comes to shape our world. Mm -hmm. See, you just think this is just some nutcase, and she is a nutcase. But this thought is what permeates mm -hmm. laws. So how do you destroy marriage? You don't get up on the television and say, we hate marriage. No, you promote homosexuality. You promote lesbianism. But that's not the goal. Now let's get transgenderism out there. You know, let's promote these things. Let's tell the women that, hey, if you, why don't you wait to get your careers established first? And then let's pick up marriage later on down the road. Well, so then what happens to that woman who's now the career woman and now she's going to step into marriage? No. This is why she's typically single at 52. Because society has ran that behind the scenes. So why did I say that, guys? So if you love the world and you're looking for validation from people who have no biblical worldview, then Proverbs 31 will mean absolutely nothing to you. See, if you're looking to be praised by the world, don't read Proverbs 31. If you want to be praised by the world, Act like the adulteress, the noisy woman, the foolish woman, the rebellious woman, and the quarrelsome woman. You 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 get your own show. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because those those women on Real Housewives are a disgrace to what women are. Those women on Married to Medicine are a disgrace. They making all that money and they act like fools. Most of these reality shows are a disgrace, or an abomination in the eyesight of God. So the Proverbs 31 woman will never get a show. So you're not looking to you're not looking to get praise from the world. That's not. If you read Proverbs 31, who are you doing this unto? Watch this. You're doing it unto the Lord first, and you're doing it unto the praise of your husband and your children. This is when this day here, Mother's Day, man, because you can look and say, I am a mother. So look at verse 1. <coughs> Look at one, 31 1. Watch this. It says, The words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. Powerful. History provides us no information for who this king was. We don't know who he is, so don't ask me at the church. I have no clue who he is. There's no record of who he is. We don't know who this guy is. But what we do know, and this is big, that this entire chapter is wisdom from his mother. Here's what I didn't know about Proverbs 31. It wasn't written by a man. It was written in Gitway. It was written down by Solomon, we know. But it was words from a mother to her son. I don't know, if that mattered to me. Because we could just dismiss it if some man wrote out, he just write down his ideal woman. Solomon just writing down who he was. Well, no, Solomon didn't come up with this. This was actually words of wisdom that a mother gave to her son. Amen. So meaning, the Proverbs 31 woman, Lindsay, is from a woman's perspective. Mm -hmm. 
That's powerful. It's from a woman's perspective. It's wisdom from the mother. Listen to this, and God showed me this, and this was awesome. In the Bible, it is the mother that provides instruction and wisdom in the home. Did you know that? Listen to this. Are y'all listening? I want y'all to hear this. This is amazing. All throughout Proverbs, wisdom is personified as a woman. That's what it notes it says she, her. Because typically, it is the woman who brings wisdom into the house. Why do you think in Proverbs 31, verse 27, it says, She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. The phrase looks well to the ways of the house means she watches over the house. She manages the affairs of the home. In Titus chapter 2, verse 3, remember that verse we talked about when it says, uh, the older women ought to teach young women, it says to be self-controlled, pure, working at home. Listen to this. The phrase workers from home in the Greek, and I looked it up, does not necessarily imply that she works from home, but what it does means she is the keeper of the home. She is the keeper of it. This is great, guys. Men are considered the leaders in the home, but the woman is considered as the one who manages the affairs of the home. What this means is that the man sets the overall goal, focus, priority, and direction of the home, while the woman, she manages the overall flow, tone, atmosphere, and life in the home. The woman sets the tone in the home. The woman sets the atmosphere. You women, you want to have the type of house when people come over, they say, man, it feels so warm here. That's you. That's, that's a compliment to you. You don't want people coming over and they just feel, hmm, it's time to go. You want to make sure that when your husband comes home, there's a warmth there. Now, oh, here come the old man. He here. What he gonna be blanking about today? That's not the atmosphere you want because the woman is the life of the home. Did you, she she brings the life. Yeah, man, you set the goal, you set the focus, but the woman manages all of that. This is why, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself because we're going to find it in this verse. Look at verse 2, Proverbs 31, verse 2. Listen how she starts it off. What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, the son of my womb? What are you doing, the son of my vows? That's a bad translation. The better translation of the verse in the Hebrew is, what shall I say to you? What shall I say to you, my son? What shall I say to you, the son of my womb? Meaning, these are almost, Nancy, like this woman's last words. She's like saying, Lindsay, what should I say to you, LJ? What do I have to say to you? What do I have to say? What is it that I want you to know? That's literally what she says. And notice is that before she gets to Proverbs 31.10, which deals with the character of the excellent wife, she deals with the character of the son. The first nine verses before you get to the virtuous woman have to do with the son. The words of wisdom she gives to her son. Let me read it all to you. Verse 3 through 9. Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. It is not for kings, O Lamuel, it is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all that are afflicted. Give strong drink to those who are perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Open your mouth for the mute and for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. That's the first thing she tells him. These, look at those words of wisdom. Guys, what does all that have to do with? That has to do with character. That has to do with character. Notice she doesn't talk to Lemuel about education. Now make sure you go to a good college. Make sure you get a good job. Uh, he, that's not what she talks to him about. Notice that the mother is not trying to run Lemuel's life. 
She's not saying, you need to listen to me. You didn't. No, no, no. She's talking to him about character, establishing character. In other words, Nancy, here's what I want you to think. Lindsay, Mom, everybody, uh, El Elder Linda, all the ones that are listening. Here's the deal. And the excellent wife is for the man with character. She is for a leader with character. She is for a man who sets the example in the household by the character of his life. A man without character doesn't get the excellent wife. He gets the adulterous, the rebellious, the noisy, the quarrelsome. Well, why are you quarreling with me? Because your character bad. Why do you think I'm arguing with you all the time? Because you're bad. Oh, wow. Why do you think I'm loud all the time? Because you ain't leading. Why you think I'm an adulteress? Because I'm a sinner. No, you ain't loving me at all. Are you getting what I'm saying? The Proverbs 31 woman is for a man with character. That's the only ones that's going to get her. Other than that, you need, that man need to go read the, the, the one before that. Because he's not getting her. He's not getting her. Because why? He won't even look for her. And, and woman, you won't get that good man because your character is shot. The woman manages the household by her... Oh, man, this is good. The woman manages her household by her wisdom she brings to the home. The man leads the household by his character he exemplifies in the home. Okay. The woman manages the household by the wisdom she brings to the home. The woman is going to be full of words of wisdom that she brings to the home. That's how she manages. How does the man, Elder Charles, though, lead the home? By his words of wisdom. Nobody want to hear about your words of wisdom. He leads the home by his character. By what he exemplifies. Please understand, men, that our so-called words of wisdom mean absolutely nothing if our character doesn't lead the way. Men, your character is what leads the home. That's what you, what you exemplify leads the home, not what you say. Mm. Women, it's not what you exemplify all the time that, ex that leads the home. Because the man ain't trying, the little son ain't trying to be you and how you doing it. Right. What, lead, what manages the home from the woman's perspective? Her words of wisdom. Her tongue. Her mouth. Because just like a man's character destroys the home, a woman's mouth mm. can also destroy it. Mm. But as a woman and as a mother, it is your words of wisdom that will shape and form the foundation of the life of her children. I'm, this is amazing. Watch this. This is truly how a woman makes the man. You know that statement? You know, you, you got to make him. You, you got to train your man. No, here's, if you really want to know what the Bible says, you want to know how you train your man? You train it till you do it to your son. You're, you're, you as a mother, you're giving him words of wisdom that help to actually make his character. And that's how when he grows up and now he finds a wife and his wife is beaming that she has a great man, that mama can look back. That dad can look back. That's all he saw in the house. Mm. That's good. Because mm. trust me, you ain't making them after you done married. <laughs> oh, you done. Yeah. You married a fool. <laughs> you married a noisy lady. You forget. No, no, no. Now, now, now you're praying. <laughs> now you're asking God to help. No. Women, if you want to do it, if, if God blesses you to have a son, mm -hmm. it's your words of wisdom that you're going to instill in that son that's going to make his character. Isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. Isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. that powerful? Yeah, John MacArthur has an entire series called God's High Calling for Women. This is why they call it the High Calling for Women. Because you help nurture and shape the women and the men in the world. You make them. The mom makes them. I don't know how do you make them. <laughs> you birth them, you make them. Wow. 
You make that woman. Why? Because your words of wisdom. You make that man. Why? Because of your words of wisdom. This is the high call of the women. Not standing behind a book boy. Look at verse 3. We're not going to go. Look at this. Do not give your strength to women or your ways to destroy kings. What is he talking about? Here's the first words of wisdom that she gives him about character. Learn to control your sexual desire. Now, we may not say it like that. We may say it differently today. That mama may tell us, oh, look here, boy. Keep your... Why do you do that? Because this woman who knows women, boy, women will take you down. You get out there and you get loose. You meet the wrong one. It'll take you down. You're going to give your strength to a woman. Your strength there can be your sexual desire, but it can also be your possessions, your wealth. You meet the wrong woman. Now you're paying for it. A man out of control sexually will always come to ruin. Again, this is, a, this, this is powerful because it comes from a woman to a mother. I'm sorry, a woman, a woman. It comes from a woman to a man. That's why I think it's powerful. It's not a man giving you this stuff. This is another woman telling you, hey man, watch out for women. <laughs> because here's what, this is Lemuel. He's a king. If you want to take a leader down, send a woman. Take him down. You take him down. Go read Proverbs. It's one of those last words. It says, for her house. It says, for the way, her path leads to death. And the, 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 her house leads down to the chambers of hell. These are powerful verses that a woman is telling her son. When you study our history, man, guess what happened? Men married a whole, men were, especially kings, they would marry a lot of daughters to other kings to form alliances with those nations. That's what happened with Solomon. That's how Solomon got 700 wives and 300 concubines. Because every time Solomon, Solomon would want to form an alliance with a nation, what would he do? He would marry the king's daughter. But the Bible went on to tell us over in 1 Kings chapter 11 that those women are the ones who took Solomon's heart away from God. And led him to worship other God. Listen to me, women. You are powerful. You are so powerful. The wisest man in the world was sacrificing his kids to the fire because he was trying to keep his woman happy. His his woman, his wives drove his heart away. Women, you are so influential in the lives of your husband, you just don't realize it. You don't realize it. You can make that Negro change gods. <laughs> that's, a, that's a movie line. <laughs> uh -huh. You don't even realize what, the power you got. You don't know what you got. Somebody says, I don't believe that. You had read Genesis 3. <laughs> Adam, who knew everything, yeah, baby. And what does God say in his curse? Because you hearkened unto the voice of your wife. That's right. <coughs> Look at Samson, the strongest man. This is our superman in the Bible. He lays down with Delilah and he, over and over she wears him down until he tells her his secrets. And now he's stuck between two pillars with his eyes gouged up begging God for another opportunity. Women, you are powerful in your home. Do you never underestimate your influence. And so look at that. She talks about character. She tells him to stay away from strong drinks. Why? Because really what she's talking about, it's not really about the drink there. It really has to do with anything that dulls your senses as a leader. She's telling her son, don't let anything impair your judgment. That's good. That's don't let good. anything impair your senses. Stay away from stuff that dull your senses, that dull your, your clarity. You don't want that. You want to always be able to think clearly. In verses 6 through 7, you can go ahead and read them yourself. She talks about strange, strong drink is for those who are perishing. It's for, it's for those who are going through things. You know, she's, she's literally telling them as the leader, it's not for you because it's going to dull your senses. You're supposed to help eliminate or alleviate the pain of others. What does this mean? What is she telling her son? She's telling her son, men must be the pillars of strength in the home. Why? Because they are the leaders. 
When a house is in turmoil, when situations and tribulations hit the home, men must stand as pillars of strength and stability in the home so that we can encourage and provide security in the lives of our children, in the lives of our wife. We have to be the pillars of strength. <coughs> and again, this is what the woman teaches her son. This isn't advice coming from another man. This is wisdom coming from a woman saying, you got to be the pillar of strength. You can't be drunk over there and you ain't thinking straight. Get that to the people who's suffering. You're supposed to be the one thinking straight and you're able to eliminate the pain and sufferings that others are going through. As men, we are, we are the pillars of strength in the home. Well, what happened when that kid weak? You called up another man. <laughs> hey, go. Oh my God, man! I just I'm about to. I don't know what I'm about to do, man. Hold it together. Hold it together. Don't crank up, cause you know once you crank up, she got you. She got you. You about to lose it? No. You stand on and be a pillar. That's why the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. No, he says a man doesn't work. This isn't about a woman not working, but she. No, you don't eat. Because we're pillars of strength. Mm. But I want to be clear, Ronald. This is what the mother mm. is teaching her son. Mm. Did you hear that? This is what. Lindsay teaches LJ when he 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 whining great. Stand up. Stop all that. Well no, John. He, he LJ's just really sensitive. Shut up! No! Yeah. He don't need to get in touch with his feminine side. Where did you get that from? That's from the devil. <laughs> the Bible talks about an effeminate man. Come on. He needs to get in touch with his masculine side. Mm -hmm. That's what that woman tells him. Get up! What are you doing? And then on the flip side, when you see that little girl acting like a boy. No, you say, what are you doing? LJ, let Jasmine, let LJ help you. Jordan, put that down. Alex, you go get that. Well, I can care. I can get all of it. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, see how the Bible talks about these things. No. This is what she's teaching Lemuel. Now watch this, guys. She even started on the wife. Because literally, <coughs> verses 8 and 9 talks about, he's, she literally is telling him, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously. What is she talking about? You're the protector. You're the protector. You're the protector. You're there to defend the people who can't defend themselves. You are the first line of defense in the home. The wisdom she gives her son is all about character. She doesn't give him anything about success in the earth or anything earthly and worldly. She did not talk to him about that. Character is the wisdom she gives to her son in the first nine verses. But in the next 22 verses, she gives her son wisdom about the character of the wife he should find. Mm. Isn't that powerful? Mm. Again, women, let me pause. This isn't talking about one lady Again, this is the goal. Look at verse 10. An excellent wife who can find. That's how we know it's not talking about a specific woman. She is far more precious than jewels. Listen, finding the right life partner is by far the most important thing we will do. And it is the most important wisdom a mother can give to her children. Because just like it says, she tells her son, an excellent wife who can find, guess what it says in Proverbs 20 verse 6, many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. So man, we ain't off the hook. She not only telling her son, who can find an excellent wife, she telling her daughter, who can find a faithful man? Now, what does she mean by that? 
A faithful man is just as rare, rare as an excellent wife. It is rare for a woman to find a man that she can wholly trust with her life and the lives of her children. Because it's fallen men, why can't she find a faithful man? The faithfulness there is not just talking about sexual immorality. It's talking about someone she can trust with her life and the life of her children. Why do women find it tough to be able to trust men with their lives? Trust men with their children? Because as fallen men, we are dominated by pride. And that woman knows that I can't trust you because your pride will get in the way and you will make bad decisions because of your pride. Mm. I have to be able to know that in the midst, Lindsay's got to know that. Because here's the deal. Men, I ain't going to tell you to put your hands up because we all got it. We can jump up in there. We all are filled to the brim with pride. Pride. We're going to be our own man. And nobody going to tell me nothing. I can dream myself. And the woman says, that's why I don't trust you behind. Because you need to ask somebody. You need to humble yourself. You don't know what you're doing. All right. You're about to lead us to hell. And you sit up and talk. See, no. No. That's us as men. So when, she, when, when she's telling her daughter... You better find a faithful man. Mm -hmm. This is somebody, baby, you can trust it with your life. That you know that even in the midst, he's going to always make the right decisions for the family. Mm -hmm. I heard what Kevin said. Proverbs is a powerful book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, this is my second time going through Proverbs again. I tell you, I'm reading it every month. Every month. I'm, when the month ends, I start it back over. All this is in Proverbs. So she told, she tells him, and uh, she tells her son that an excellent, virtuous wife is more valuable than rubies. What is he talking about? More no, she's literally saying that she is more valuable than anything he could ever acquire in the earth. In other words, a wife that is excellent is the most important thing you can acquire in the earth. It's more important than a position at the job. It's more important than millions. It's more important than status. The most important thing that you can acquire in the earth is a virtuous woman. And watch this. If mom will like this, it's 22 verses. Say 22 verses. Each verse begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's known as an acrostic. This is how w women would teach it in their home. Because in Hebrew, you have Aleph, Bet, uh, uh, Dalev, all the different uh, Hebrew alphabets. So they would go through the alphabets and quote, the, quote each verse they went with. And this is how the child learned it. This is how the woman learned it. This is how the son learned it. This is an acrostic. And to help scale it down, listen to this. And, and, and I'm going to give it to you like this. In verses 11 through 12, that deals with the excellence to her husband. In verses 13 through 24, it deals with the excellence to her home. In verses 25 through 31, it deals with the excellence of her heart. You might need them again. <laughs> In verses 1 through 12, it deals with the excellence to her husband. In verses 13 through 24, it deals with the excellence to her home. In verses 35 through 20, I'm sorry, uh, 25 through 31, it deals with the excellence of her heart. All with age, you see, husband, home, heart. Husband, home, heart. That's the flow. Husband, home, heart. Now watch this. In Proverbs 31, listen to, look at verse 11 through 12. Now, now here's the deal. Don't get bogged down in the specifics. Because a lot of these things we're not doing now. You don't have to travel a far off to go get food. You can just go to the local Kroger. Okay, you get it when it says she, she travels a far off. You don't have to travel a far off. You just go right to the refrigerator and pick something out. They didn't have refrigerators back then. You see what I mean? So don't get caught up in the specifics. You need to get caught up in the application. 
the principle that's being taught there. In verse 11 and 12, it says, The heart of her husband trusts her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. His mother begins her words of wisdom to her son with the most important relationship in the home, and that's the marriage to her husband. That's the most important relationship. The most important relationship in the home is the husband and the wife. That's more important than the kids. You see how society is flipped it though. In society, what's the most important thing in the home? The children. And if it ain't the children, it's just the wife. Some people, it's the dog. <laughs> but what the Bible says is the most important relationship in the home is the, is the woman's marriage to her husband. The, notice what it says. The heart of her husband trusts her. I looked this up, guys. The heart of her, of her husband is not just talking about his heart, but it is talking about all the things that he loves. This is a man who can trust his wife with the home, the family, all the affairs of the home, the, his possessions. That's what it means by the heart of the man. You get it? It's not talking about he can trust the woman just with his heart. He's talking about he can trust the woman, Roscoe, with all the things that he loves. Because he knows that she's there to do him good and not harm. I can trust you with the things that I love. And what does the man love? He loves his home. He loves his family. His business dealings. His possessions. He, like in other words, you, an excellent mother or an excellent wife, is that one who her husband can trust her. The excellence to her husband is that she cares for the things her husband's her husband loves. The husband knows that his wife has his best interests. Do you understand that? Just like men, women, you want to understand that your husband got your best interests. You know, some men don't think his wife, they, they, they wife got their best interests. Mm -hmm. A lot of men, if you go ask them secretly, you want to know who they, what they think? They think that you got your own best interests. Right. You ain't really got mine in blame because you can kill us by the things I love. You kill us by the things I want. You kill us by what I'm trying to do. You, you got your own. You see, that's what it means by the heart of her husband trust her. Mm -hmm. So she's telling her son, baby, you want to find a woman you can give your entire heart to. And I'm not talking about just your love, the things you love, that you can trust her. You get it? This wife has been placed in her husband's life to do him good. You want to be an excellent wife? You want to be an excellent mother? Do good. Know that you are there to do. Let, make sure your husband knows that I'm here to do you good. Father's they coming down the road. But I want. <laughs> I'm here to do you good, baby. I'm, I, I'm, not here to, I'm not here to stash away cash for myself and I'm about to rip you dry. <laughs> I'm not here to build my own empire and your empire is crumbling. I'm like, yeah, you get off your sorry behind and do something. I'm not here to take the kids and, and, and I care more about the kids and the husband wish he could, he was a good child. And he can get some attention. What sets the dinner table? What does the husband love to eat? Mm -hmm. Well, kids don't like that. That's why I pick these chicken nuggets and corn. <laughs> well, I'm a grown man. I, I don't want no chicken nuggets. Well, you gonna eat them today? You know, there's some down the street. You got JJ's down there. You got Wendy. You got a Brill Shack. You got this. I don't know what you think you're talking to. Who you? Thank you all. You see, and that and where you go, give me give me ten nuggets and uh, put the corn on the side. Can I get a see I get some mustard with mine? Y'all get what you get what I'm talking about, though. 
heard you chicken niggas in the corner. You see what I mean? Look, oh. her excellence first is to her husband. Women, y'all, 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 talk to me, women. Are y'all hearing this? Yes. Amen. Yeah. It's tight, but he's doing Yeah. I mean, here's the deal. Her excellence is, is to her husband. That's the first thing. It's to her husband. And now watch this. It goes to the second category, the excellence to her home. So the first two verses, the heart of her husband trusts her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm. But what is the next verse? It's, to, it's, the, it's the excellence to her home. Home. The largest section of the passage is it, 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 it deals with the home. Why? Because that's really God's high calling for women. Mm. It is where the this is the hardest thing for women to understand. The home is where the woman finds her purpose. Mm. Right. That's true. That's true. Now, again, that's it true. doesn't mean that she works from home. That's not the focus that is trying to say. She is the keeper. Of the home. She keeps it. Man, this is why women love their homes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I never forget the moment on this. When they were getting ready to move, daddy went and found a home. <laughs> It was just typical of what a man would find. Oh, God. <laughs> hey, I found something. Mama looked at it. This? <laughs> now, they moved in there, and it was a disaster. Oh, it was not what mom wanted. This was, And mom said, you didn't consult me, really, with any of this. Because you know how we are, man. Hey, I found something, baby. Now, you ain't find that. <laughs> <laughs> because why? Her home is where she finds her purpose. Amen. Why, guys? Here's, a, here's another tough statement. Remember, man was created to give glory to God while the woman was created to bring glory to the man. Oh. That ain't in the Bible. Okay, 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7. For a man ought not to cover his head since he is in the image and the glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. Wives, women, God created you to bring glory to your man, your husband. And as doing so, that is how you bring glory to God. God is not interested in you bringing him glory and you do not honor your husband. To honor your husband is to honor God. To bring glory to your husband is to bring glory to God. Keep your state praise to yourself. If you not, you get it? Well, what does he tell the man? I love you, God. I love you. You're lying. You don't love your wife. You are a selfish imbecile. You only thinking about yourself. You don't care about what your wife loves. You don't care about what your wife wants. You don't care about what your wife desires. All you want is your desires feel. But you're going to go to church talking about you love me. You don't. You are a selfish individual. You get it? How do we show God we love him, men? We love our wives. Women, how do you give glory to God? Are you giving glory to your husband? Are you bringing him glory? Hey, no! Okay. <laughs> Don't make me cuss up in this church. I turn on a broadcast on Mother's Day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I mean that. What was that? That was on uh, <laughs> no, Jerry McGuire. He said, he was telling Robinson, he said, man, you, you know, you, you a little selfish. You ain't know, thinking about yourself. He said, you need to play with some more heart. Remember, he got mad. But I'm all heart. You know, like, what are you talking about? No, he wasn't. And that's how a woman fan, you, you, you're saying these things. What are you talking about? No, that's why you were created. 
Look at verse 13 to 15. It says, she seeks wool and flax and works with the willingness of her hands. She is like the ships of merchants. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and the portions of her maidens. What is that talking about? Guys, don't get caught up in the specifics. What is the application? The application of those verses is, it's showing you her devotion, her dedication, and her commitment to her home. She's committed. If she got to raise up early to get it, she'll rise up early to get it. If she got to go far back in those ancient days, guess what? In the ancient days, you ate the same food every day because you only ate what was culturally in your area. What if she wanted the husband to get some different delicacies? She had to wake up early and go to a different land and go get that food and bring it back home. It's showing you her dedication. She wants to bring variety in because she loves the home. <laughs> it's not the same old slop, you know, just say, this is what I made. You don't like it? <laughs> it, 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 it it's short. <laughs> it's short. And Liz don't do that. I don't, that's not why. She does not do that. Mama doesn't do that. Mama didn't do that when we were growing up. What I'm trying to say is, you just forget <laughs> every day. But it's only sandwich. <laughs> Your husband ain't never getting breakfast. <laughs> you better stop at this stone. <laughs> Baby, uh, you gonna wake up? Wake up early! She waking up at the last moment. She, 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 she barely getting out the house. Are you talking about cook some breakfast? Man, we got some pancakes on the stick of them. Uh, 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 we, we, we got some frozen Jimmy D sausages. You better put that in the microwave. But well, baby, you gonna put a cup of coffee? I made coffee for myself. Bye. Oh my God. Y'all hearing this? Don't worry, women. We gonna get the men on Father's Day. Now, see, I should have said that. Ain't nobody gonna get no Father's Day. Come, go like, hey, Joe, we going out of town. Man. We got a vacation coming up, man. You get it, guys? What are the verses talking about? Her dedication to the home. Women, are you dedicated to that home? Your devotion to it? Man, the application has to do with her heart. That's why it says. It, notice what it says. She works willingly with her hands. She's like a merchant ship. What is that talking about? It's talking about her heart. She takes pleasure in the care of the home. Right. She wants to do it. It's not drudgery. It's not duty. Yes, it's not modern day slavery. The long car go on. She's slapping and get up. Here we go. Chain game. I'm on the clock. <laughs> no, she, she wants to do it. It has to do with the heart. That's the application. You're not no ship. We know that. We know you don't have to travel afar. You can go buy the stuff. You, you, you bought the stuff two months ago and put it in the deep freezer. That way, that's your own far to the freezer. You already was playing. Verse 16 through 20. Look at what it says. She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arm strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hand to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hand to the needy. What's the application? The application is her prudence and business savvy is for the betterment of the whole. Not for her own selfish, materialistic game. She's not building a business for herself. No mm -hmm. word. This isn't Lindsay Enterprises. And she's only thinking of herself. No. Why is she doing this stuff? Because she wants to beautify and better the home. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you guys, what this verse is talking about, women... You're the keeper of the home. You want that home to look beautiful? Baby, don't buy me this. Don't buy me that. No, you go. You work with your hands. You beautify it. It's your domain. Because what is the man supposed to be doing with his money? Taking care of the home. Are you getting paying for all the stuff? See, that? See this is where we, we end up going into the hole, man, because that's what we're supposed to be doing. The woman says, so so don't you go home and tell your wife, if you want that, then you go by Negro, well, then you pay half this stuff. 
Let's see what your check can pay for. No, you better keep your mouth closed because you know she pay half the bill. All you want is me, but she pay all of them. You gonna talk about well, you need you need to beautify this place, man. You better take these stale looking jail walls, and you better be fine with it because you ain't paying for nothing. <laughs> but no, when that man is doing his part, and if that woman has her own business, she's doing her own thing. Guess what that money goes to? That money's going to the beautifying of the home, man. Her whole paycheck is, is looking to, to to save money because it talks about she she buys a field. How does she buy that field? She saved. She's not going to her baby, buy me a field. <laughs> buy me a field. Buy, buy you a field. No, she went and bought it. Verse 18, she's a, I love this, guys. She, uh, she's a wise businesswoman. No, notice what it talks about. What does it say? Verse 18, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Then what is this talking about, Nancy? This is not an impulsive, rash, or witless woman. She's not into some get rich scheme. No, she knows that what she is doing is profitable. She knows, hey baby, I got something here. How you know? Wait till I buy that field. Verse 19. Uh oh. She puts her hand to the distaff and her hands uh, 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 hold the spindle. When you go look up that whole verse, no, you're not doing that now, but what is it talking about? She's not lazy, she's a worker. She's a worker. Wow. This is the Christian woman. Look at verse 24, <coughs> 21. I'm going, through these, I'm, I'm going through these real fast. She is not afraid of snow for her household. For her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. And, the clo and her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. And when he sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them. And she delivers sashes to the merchandise. The idea of verse 21 is to say that the excellent wife is a planner. She is not afraid of snow for her household. For her household are clothing. She prepares for the winter. Mm -hmm. You want to know what makes the, the, uh, the, the, the excellent wife? She's an organizer. She's a planner. She's prepared. That's one thing you can always see about women. Think about it. When they want to go on vacation, man, they try to plan a vacation. They say, yeah, you're like, man, I'll wait to see what hotel's available the month before we leave. <laughs> oh, we going in two weeks? Let me find some rooms. <laughs> the woman, she can't deal with that. Oh, baby, oh, my God. Oh, my God, where we going? She's a planner. She's an organizer. She's, she does things well thought out. During ancient times, guys, when it says that she makes her bed covers, that ain't talking about making up the bed. <laughs> No, she actually made the bed. The women back in them days made the mattress. She made it. So before everybody went to sleep, because guess what? We're not talking about mattresses that you had laid out and you had a little bedroom to go to. No, she had to take up the mattress, dismantle it so you could have room in the house to walk around in. And then at night, before everybody went to sleep, guess what she did, Nancy? She made another bed. <laughs> she made another mattress. This is a woman who cares about her home. She cares about the comfortability of her family. She didn't say, I'm tired, sleep on the floor. I don't feel like it. Now, she made her, but she ain't made nobody else. No, this, this is a woman who cares about comfortability of her home. And I like what it says. It says, uh, she makes a bedroom. Her clothing is fine, linen, and purple. She doesn't forget about herself. Mm -hmm. See, I don't want you to think this is some Matilda. Or this is some Butch. No, she cares about what she looks like. Her linen is like her, her linen is purple. Her linen and purple. She wears linen and purple. In the Hebrew, those are garments of dignity and class. <clears throat> and look at what it says. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders. And, and, and what is that talking about? The husband is known in the gates not only because he may be one of the leaders of the city, but because of the dignity and the grace and the class of his wife. He is known. Because his wife is so classy. In other words, when he sits at the gates, guess what all the men say? Boy, you got a heck of a woman. I wish my old hag was doing that stuff, man. She could kill us by me. She actually pushed me out here to these gates. She don't let me come home. And man, when I, my ball and chain over here, you know, she don't let me do nothing. She's spinning up everything. She always want a new donkey, new cows. I, I ain't got nobody to say, huh? But, but, but brother, Jack, man, you got one now. You got a woman now, boy. What a woman you got. That's what that's talking about. That, 
the woman makes her husband known. Because why? Of how she carries herself. They look at her, man. They look at your wife saying, what a woman. What a woman. And look at this, guys. Look at the last, the couple last verses. Verse 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing. Mm -hmm. she, this is talking about the excellence of her heart. She laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Verse 25, the strength and dignity of her clothing is not referring to here what she wears, but it's talking about the condition of her heart. Strength means condition. Character means dignity. Mm -hmm. This woman is a woman of dignity. She's a woman of strength. She, her mind and heart is strong. I like the phrase, she laughs at the time to come. What is that? It, it's better translated, she smiles at the future. Mm -hmm. This means that she is not bogged down with the worry or the cares of this world. Why? Because she knows how to manage the affairs of her home. She doesn't look at the future in fear because she's prepared. Good. She sits back and she's done her part. Oh, you know winter coming. I'm ready. Oh, you know, man, winter getting old. We good. Oh, you know, man, they said it's going to be a harsh, harsh spring. The crops may not grow. I put a little bit back. She's a preparer. She doesn't worry about the future. Why? Because she's ready. What does Jesus say to Martha? Martha, Martha, thou art troubled and worried about many things. Mm -hmm. This woman's heart is in the right place. Verse 26, when she speaks, when she speaks, it is wisdom speaking, not worldly opinion, not out of control emotions, not stupidity speaking. Her most important communication communication quality is that she provides wisdom and instruction, watch this, in the spirit of kindness. It's not that she just speaks wisdom. Look at what it says. The teachings of kindness is on her lips. Are you a kind woman? You, know, you got some mean mamas out there. Just some mean mamas. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah, I'm good about it. Where your daddy at? He ain't give me nothing. You see, just an old mean person. Every time you open your mouth, it's meanness coming out. No, she provides wisdom and kindness. And look at what it says in the last verses. Verse 28. This is the good, best part. <coughs> oh, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. And listen to what the husband says. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her work praise her in the gates. This is what the excellent wife lives for. When her children are grown, that's what it means, her children rise up, meaning they're grown now, guess what they do? They now realize that they were blessed to have a mother like her. Mm -hmm. This is when she sits back on Mother's Day and she smiles and she looks back at all her children and she sees that they're successful, their lives are going this right. way, they're in the Lord, they know Christ, mm -hmm. and she just sits back. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They could... Guess what the children do? They call her blessed. Her husband doesn't forget about it anyway. Why? Because now this woman has raised her own children. They're not, they're not raising their children. And guess how they're patterning, patterning their ways off of what mama taught. Mm -hmm. The husband notices her well. And what does he say? Here you go, Kevin. Here's what, he, here's what we're saying. Many women have done excellently, but you surpassed them all. Literally, man, what a compliment to your wife, baby. Literally, what that man is saying, you the best. You are the best. You are the best. But notice it says that charm is deceitful. This ain't some superficial woman. Because what? She fears the Lord. That's what's rooting her. What's grounding her is her fear of the Lord. Her fear of the Lord. And when it says in verse 31, mothers tell, the mother tells her son finally that when you find a woman like that, make sure you give her praise. Mm -hmm. Because why? Her life garners that type of praise. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 31 is beautiful. But it's all how you look at it with the right perspective. Amen? Amen. 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 Come on. Stand to your feet, guys. Thank you guys for joining with us. We appreciate you. Happy Mother's Day to all our mothers out there. We love you and we hope 
that you will be able to set this as your goal, set this as the thing that you want to strive to on this Mother's Day. And don't forget, dads, we're going to talk to you on Father's Day. But boy, we want to make sure that we honor our mothers especially. And if you had a mother that exemplified any of these qualities, remember, nobody's going to exemplify all of these. But you've had mothers that have exemplified these things, praise her on this day. If you have a wife that exemplifies some of these things, praise her on this day because this is the day that the world has set aside for us to do so. So we thank you. We hope you join with us on Wednesday. We'll see you on Sunday. God bless you.